architecture as a language. And I think uh, you have to have a grammar in order to have a language. If you are good at that, you speak a wonderful prose. And if you are really good, you can be a poet. Architecture belongs to the epoch and not even to the time, as they say, to a real epoch. What is the essence of the epoch? And that is the only thing we really can express. You know, you have to, to construct something. You can make a garage out of it, or you can make a cathedral out of it. So the same means, the same structural methods we use. My idea was always we have to do something together. We have to pull the whole thing together. We have to destroy these separations between painting and sculpture and architecture and design and so on. It is all one. Once I understood that, I would not be for fashion in architecture. I would look for more profound principles. The final aim of the Bauhaus for me was architecture. I thought there's only one person I think he could really do it. That is Mies van der Rohe. Fortunately, he accepted to take over the Institute. And he again, from his own personal point of view, went much stronger into the architectural department and built up a new curriculum for architecture in the Institute. But very soon came the end of it, the Nazi destroyed it. He had to move away from Dessau to Berlin and very provisionally only he put it up in an old factory in Berlin. And after a very short while, the Nazis closed the house and he couldn't go on. Most beautiful, the best building in New York. Washington Bridge, you know, that, uh, that grew. But first I had to, to uh, uh, conquer the idea, and later I appreciated uh, it as a beauty. Thomas Aquinas, uh, he says, reason is the first principle of all human work. Under the influence of science and technology, I would ask myself, you know, what can that be, you know? What result comes from this fact, you know? Can we change it or can we not change it? And the answer of this question, you know, gave me the direction which I followed, not what I liked. You know. You know, I throw often things out I like very much. They are dear to my heart. But when I have a better conviction, a better idea, a clearer idea by that, I mean, uh, then I follow the clearer idea. A man, when he lives progressively, very far utopian, then when he is getting old, he is still fresh enough and young enough from the point of view of the others looking at him. Now, when you have grasped that once, you know, then you act accordingly. So I would throw everything out, but there's no reasonable. I don't want to be interesting. I want to be good.
Mies van der Rohe, born 1886 in Germany, is best known for his leading role in developing modernism, large-scale changes in both technology and society. He began his architectural career in a studio working alongside two titans of modernism, Walter Gropius and Le Corbusier. His famous phrase, less is more, is commonly used today, although most people do not know its origins. He began to develop this style through the 1920s. This decade is best remembered for Mies van der Rohe by his, although unbuilt, all-glass Freudenstruck skyscraper in 1921 and his 1929 Barcelona pavilion. Mies was director of the Bauhaus and served as its leader until it closed three years later due to pressure from the Nazi government. A year before this happened, Mies van der Rohe's work was exhibited in the Museum of Modern Art. This reinforced Mies' role as leader of the modernist movement and brought the movement itself to a new, wider audience. Mies emigrated to the USA in 1937 due to the continued rise of the Nazis in his home country. He became the head of Illinois Institute of Technology for 20 years. While at IIT, he began what is now commonly known as the Second School of Architecture, which was a group of simplified rectilinear high-rise buildings such as the 860-880 Lakeshore Drive and the Seagram Building. He also continued to develop similar projects to his Barcelona Pavilion, such as the Farnsworth House, which is a completely transparent home that was completed in 1951. The following five structures are some of Mies van der Rohe's best designs. 5. Villa Tugendhat This historic, reinforced concrete building in the Czech Republic was built between 1928 and 1930. It soon became an icon for modernism. Mies used his revolutionary iron framework, which enabled him to dispense with the supporting walls and arrange the interior in order to achieve a feeling of space and light. 4. The Seagram Building The Seagram Building epitomises elegance and the principles of modernism. The 38-storey building was his first attempt at tall office construction. 3. Farnsworth House Designed in 1947 and constructed in 1951, the Farnsworth House is a vital part of American architecture and is a perfect representation of both the international style of architecture as well as the modernists' movement desire to juxtapose the sleek, streamlined design of modern structures with the organic environment of the surrounding nature. His less is more philosophy is easy to see in this design. 2. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library This is the only library built by Mies van der Rohe. Upon entering the landmark building, visitors are welcomed to the beating heart of the library, the Great Hall. In 2017, the building closed to begin a modernisation, including a major reconstruction of the interior of the building. The total cost of this three-year renovation is expected to be around $208 million. 1. Barcelona Pavilion It is an important building in the history of modern architecture, known for its simple form and its spectacular use of extravagant materials, such as marble, red onyx, and travertine. It has inspired many other important modernist buildings. Mies, hey man, what are you doing here? <coughs> are, you, are you smoking a, a cigar in here? <laughs> I don't even think that's allowed. What are you, what are you, what are you looking at, man? It's kind of, it's kind of creepy the way you're looking into the, the house, you know, it, you didn't put any walls in there and you're just kind of like leering in. Well, yeah. So uh, either way, it's it's cool to see you here. You know, I thought you were uh, dead, but uh, congrats on all the great work and uh, I'll see you around. Open plans may sound similar to open concept, but when used in an architectural context, it means something very specific and is associated with how the architect Mies van der Rohe and a few select early 20th century architects explored the dissolution of rooms and eventually the visual dissolution of building boundaries. In our previous videos, we looked at the organic architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright as a specific case of open concept. His was a diagonal overlap of rooms to create a building design from the inside out as a singular cohesive entity with organs all working together like an organism. With the free plans of Le Corbusier, a simple shape is subdivided by a grid of columns, walls divide up space, and are threaded through with a specific path to experience these elements in a scripted sequence that was called an architectural promenade. These two, organic and free plans, not only create specific interior experiences, they also extend to generate a unique experience on the exterior. Organic plans connect to the outside through corner windows, which project inhabitants out into the surroundings, whereas free plans frame the outside with views that present it like a painting hanging on a wall. So let's trace the work of Mies van der Rohe to record how free plans evolved. 
describing it as an evolution will allow us to look at its various aspects in isolation as they develop within his work over time. Mies van der Rohe was born in Germany and worked there until moving to Chicago in 1938. It's with designs for two unbuilt houses in his home country where we can see the first leap toward an open plan. The two houses we'll compare are the Lessing House and the Brick House, both of which Mies was working on at the same time, even though they exhibit fundamentally different approaches to space. The Lessing House plan is a complex of rectangles, broken into a few primary shapes that are combined together. Each primary shape is subdivided into a series of neatly adjacent rectangular rooms. Some rooms are more private and removed, some are actually courtyards or outdoor spaces contained within the primary envelope of the house. While anyone looking at this house would still call it modern, it does not yet exhibit the qualities of an open plan. Then there's the brick house, and it's here where Mies is really able to propose a new level of continuity between the interior and the exterior space. He achieves this by focusing on the wall as a primary architectural element and liberating it to do things beyond just the job of creating enclosure. In the brick house, the walls are independent entities that seem to explode into a composition of spaced out, right-angled lines. The walls stop and start at will, and seem like they only just happen to coalesce into a house. The line between inside and outside is hardly registered by the walls alone, and some walls extend so far out in the landscape they almost seem like they could go on forever. Mies found a way to dissolve the legibility of the building by challenging its outer boundary. Walls don't just trace the boundary of the building, or rooms anymore, they're placed almost randomly relatively to the boundary of the house, and in some cases even run perpendicular to it, pointing outward into the landscape beyond. The concept of space is presented as an even field, where the architect manipulates portions of this field in a gradient fashion, almost like gravity influences certain zones in the universe. A couple of years later, Amis is able to realize his design for the Barcelona Pavilion, a building constructed as part of the World Exposition in 1929 and was meant to present Germany to the world as a thoroughly modern and pacifist country after their role in World War I. In this structure, walls are again deployed in such a way so as to express their independence and liberation as elements that can do things other than merely enclosed space. While there is a guiding grid on the ground as a reference pattern for organization and composition, the walls are intentionally misaligned with the grid. Amis sets up the rules and the expectations for a rigid organization, and then he completely disregards regards them. This enhances the perception that these elements are under the influence of some guiding force that operates at a level independent from this initial framework. The walls of the Barcelona Pavilion are still made of block or brick, but in this case they're framed with veneers of marble. This pattern and colorful lining wraps the wall like a present and further defines it as a singular element or object without the visible markers that subdivide it into discrete parts like bricks. The wall is the important and expressed thing and we as visitors don't perceive the parts that are gathered together to make it up. We as occupants are also left to interpret whether the wall is recruited to help with hold up the roof. That's because the building also includes a small regular grid of structural columns. The grid is almost treated like a discrete object unto itself. It's not an endless field. Instead, it stops and starts well before it encounters any natural edges of the building. The grid is relegated to just a small area within the explosion of the walls. The columns are impossibly thin, chrome-clad crosses. The shape of the column marks a singular point in space, and the chrome reflective material challenges observers to perceive their true size. Further, the column's thinness reveals that they can't be trusted to do all the work of holding up the roof. So, structurally, the walls and the columns must be working together, even if compositionally it looks like they're placed in a haphazard relationship. Nowhere is this more poignant than at the entrance of the interior of the pavilion, where two columns are placed perfectly aligned against a background wall. The columns are presented almost like a still-life artwork to be viewed, complete with the backdrop. While elements appear to be slipping past one another in space, the elements sometimes snap perfectly into a precise composition. The Barcelona Pavilion is primarily a steel structure. When we were examining the free plan of Le Corbusier, the construction material was concrete. A concrete column has mass, and the shape of the columns in the Villa Savoie are round. While thin compared to stone construction, they still have girth but the Mesian column is just a cross at a point. The column has flat surfaces, which define edges of space, rather than Le Corbusier's, which were more sculptural and take up space. Corbusier's are convex, versus Mises are concave. The Mesian wall in the Barcelona Pavilion is different from Le Corbusier's wall too. Corbs are almost immaterial, just white stucco planes that bend, or may contain rectangular opening frames punched into them. The Mesian wall has a materiality and pattern with its marble or its travertine veneer. They're not bending around here, nor do they have any openings punched in them. Each is a fragment of pure, 
unadulterated wellness. Movement on the Barcelona Pavilion isn't particularly scripted either. The visitor is free to roam and explore. Mies is able to call attention to particular moments in the design through the arrangement of elements, not with a prescribed path of view angles. The building is like a spatial field of elements arranged freely that interact with precision and express the flowing nature of space as a stage for holding and relating objects. The shape of the building seems to dissolve at its edges, creating ambiguous delineations between inside and outside. Finally, we can take a look at Mises' Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois, where the open plan finds yet another level of expression. The house is a glass box hanging from the standard I-beam columns located on the outside of the building. This configuration is called an umbrella diagram, where the roof is held up from outside support and the interior is free from structure altogether. Again, we have an unmolested regular grid of columns in the Farnsworth house. However, whereas the crosses are the same in two directions, I-beams have a singular orientation, which gives a grain and a direction to the underlying grid. The rectangle that includes the house has an enclosed zone and an open one. There's an ambiguous reading to the collection. One way to read it is as two parallel linear arrangements, and the other is as an even field that could be imagined to continue in any direction. Here the wall loses its primacy, as the building is a few horizontal planes with some furniture and a built-in wooden object that holds functional elements like the kitchen and the bathrooms. The wooden object doesn't go all the way to the ceiling, so as to reinforce the idea that it's an object set within the field that are defined by the columns and the horizontal planes. The wooden object is located so as to provide spatial differentiation where necessary. There's a minimum amount of elements to provide the maximum amount of spatial articulation. Despite the lack of walls, it is still possible to point out the dining room, the kitchen, the bedroom, and the living room. Sheets of glass that span clear between the floor slab and the ceiling provide the limited enclosure of the house. These are lined with a track of curtains which open and close depending on the inhabitant's desire for privacy or for shading. There are multiple consequences of the window wall when we compare it to either the corner window on the right or the ribbon window of Corbusier. Window walls transform the perception of the building and appear different whether it is nighttime or daytime. During the day, one has an unbroken view of the surrounding landscape. It's not a complete immersion in nature though, and these describe the effect as a separation and a distancing from nature that allows you to see it or contemplate it anew. During the night, the dark exterior increases the effect of the reflections and heightens the sense that there's a surface surrounding you. This increases the perception of enclosure, and the mirrored reflections visually extend the interior into an infinite expanse. This makes literal the conception that space extends infinitely between the two planes of the floor and the ceiling. With open plans, we finally start to have a freely floating, fully articulated slab. Columns help to delineate and define space. Movement is freed from paths. Walls are either treated as objects or disappear altogether and thus windows are no longer punches and facades, rather they are full sheets of glass spanning from floor to ceiling. So that's how open plans are unique in the triad of open concept plan types. I hope you have found this video enlightening and entertaining, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks.